Michael Meredith, an architect in New York City. Uh, I teach at Princeton University. Um, I practice with my wife and partner, Hilary Sample. Uh, we live and work in Harlem, in Manhattan. We live, we are a small office, uh, as you can tell. We live upstairs from the office. We have our family here our, as well. Uh, so we, are re we really live, you know, there's no separation between, I'd say, our life and our work. My dad was an engineer uh, and my mom was a school teacher. Uh, but and my, my grandfather, I guess, he was a math teacher in Canada. I, my mom's Canadian, so I have Canadian dual citizenship. But my, um, my grandfather, I remember as a kid, he would always design and build a house over the summer with students from his school. And so he would, that I think I was aware of as a kid. And so we'd always, see, he'd make these, they were very, let's say, almost like of their time, like a Frank Lloyd, like a kind of Frank Lloyd Wright knockoffs or something, but like um, uh, split levels and stuff like this of, of their time. Um, and so he would do drawings and he would, he would be the contractor also, he would b build them. So I was always, I was around that a little bit as a kid, but I didn't, I took one architecture class in high school because I think for some reason I thought, because of probably my, my grandfather, I thought, oh, I want to be an architect at a young age. And I, I took an architecture class and I hated it. Uh, and I said, I don't know, it's not for me. And so when I applied to school, to college, I applied, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I was like, I, I had no idea. I didn't want to do anything, honestly. I probably still don't know if I want to do anything. But like the... Um, uh, I applied for economics and philosophy and just, you know, I've, I applied for all these different things everywhere. And, um, and art, I, I think I wanted to do art. I had got, I was very, I, I was, I won a lot of awards and I was sort of recognized in the school for being able to draw well and paint and all these things. And so, um, but then when it came to the time to go, my father, my father said, listen, I'm not going to help. I'm not going to put money towards art school. It's just not, you, I, I want you to get a job. I don't want you to be living off of me forever kind of thing. Um, you need to get a job where you can make money, you know, be a responsible member of society. And um, so I said, okay, I'll try architecture. And I went to Syracuse. I met Hillary there at first uh, the first semester of school. Um, we sat like one person between us um, and our assigned seats. And the, the um, and I gave it a, a shot. I, I would say I wasn't, I would say even at that time, I wasn't really a great student. I was up and down. I was sort of, I was a probably, probably like what I would not want to deal with as a teacher uh, now. But I was just difficult. I questioned everything. I um, I got along with, yeah, like I said, I got along with like half the faculty, and, and usually the ones that were more visitors than the, the full time, the old guard there that were teaching. The old guard was sort of teaching. They're all from Cornell, and they were teaching a kind of third wave of Colin Row uh, kind of pedagogy. So like for me, even at Syracuse, our, our history class was, when we were taught history, we had a class where we would just draw, have to draw Palladian villas from memory, which is kind of a you know, model that doesn't exist anymore. Um, and, and, and Cool House was on the rise. We all were, and that was kind of, and Shumi also was a kind of influence as a way out of that for us as students, I think. So, and Morphosis to Maine. I remember the drawings were just always like kind of beautiful and wild. You know, it was like at the time, also Ray Gun Magazine was around and like they sort of seemed to fit this other aesthetic that was kind of floating um, around. It seemed more liberating than, than what we were being taught. I'd say I was a kind of up and down student. I would never, I, Hillary was, a very good student. 
like in a way, like did really well. I think all the teachers really liked her. I think I was, I was, uh, I don't think I was like that. But the, um, and then after that moved to New York, I tried to get a job upstate. There was a kind of crash at that time in the mid nineties uh, of economics. So I wanted to stay at home and try to make money, but I couldn't get a job near where I grew up, which is in upstate New York, um, near Schenectady in Saratoga, that area. It's like, it's like uh, three hours north of here, or two and a half, three hours, yeah. And um, so I had friends who were living in New York, and so I just came and crashed with them and then looked for a job in New York, anything I could get. And I think that's kind of where my education began, really, in earnest as an architect. When I came to New York, I, I worked at a small office. Uh, it was, it was um, not a great office. Uh, it was a, com a commercial office. I just, whatever I could get. It was the first job I could, that someone asked me to, to do something, um, or that wanted me, I guess. Um, and then I would volunteer. I volunteered at a lot of places, so I volunteered at Storefront art and architecture and I'd help like do whatever they needed, like anything. I worked with Kyung Park, who was the director and he founded Storefront Kyung and his uh, wife and partner, Shireen Nishat, who's an artist, uh, Iranian artist. And, um, and I was just always hanging out in their loft and helping them do whatever they wanted. And I was always, I would just do whatever I could. I didn't, you know, in, in a way I, I, that gave, me introduced me to a lot of people uh, in New York and introduced me to a whole other set of ideas and concerns and things like this. And I think from that, that, and that helped a lot and, and also made things more accessible, architecture in some ways. Like you could, you meet all the people. I remember, you know, you hang out with Jean Nouvel or something at a party and you, you know what it would be. It was just like people were around. And so I, I started doing a lot of competitions and I started doing a lot, I just was more engaged, started making little books, publishing them at Printed Matter. I was just doing stuff. I was always working. I think if anything, uh, one of the, I think we just work a lot in a way. It's probably our strength as an, you know, <laughs> as an office is that we're, we, 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 we are constantly working. I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, actually, but it, it is what it is. I mean, I grew up in like I said, upstate New York. It was kind of suburban, but also it was also very like my, I went to public school, and it was a very it's a very good public school because because where my dad was an engineer, and all he worked at General Electric, and there was like the R and D center was there, so it meant it was already like all, all my friends were not were like Chinese or Indian or Korean or whatever, German, like there was all, there's already this kind of global because of the engineers and the research and development part of it. It was very global in some ways. Um, and I think that was unique to, to that place I grew up in. It was a very good school. It was very progressive, let's say things like this. And so it was, and my father also was was particularly good at, and my mom too, at at trying to enable and help us learn and teach us stuff. Like like because of that community. Like for instance, my mom. I don't know how she did this, but she would find all these. Uh, basically, like I would learn. She'd find these women who who were generally the wives of some of the engineers and drop us off there after school at their places. And we would learn like German and French and she, you know, like stuff like this, like, or I would take painting with some, I remember with a Latvian woman, I was in her basement doing painting and then it sent me to someone else, this, this Swedish woman to do pottery and stuff like this. Like she, she, we would be, um, I was sort of shuffling around these suburban areas and finding places to do things and to learn. My mom, like batiking, I did so much batiking, which is a very particular process of, of wax and dye fabrics and stuff like, like and making these kind of fabric things. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know about origins. I don't really have a sense of origin. 
in a, in a, in a classic sense. Like, I think, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I have, I have uh, experiences that are probably m my own, but they're, but probably shared also with all, many others. Um, you know, I listened to a lot of music, um, as a, you know, I read a lot. I was probably a, a bookish and shy kid more than now. I was, was really into, I still think about these things. I went through these phases as a kid, like really into like the Bhagavad Gita or something like this, like, and reading it or trying to teach, yeah, just learning about everything I could learn about and, and getting obsessed with certain uh, bands and, you know, whatever it would be. Like, I, I just went through phases, like every probably teenager. Mentors, I mean, Toshiko Mori was a mentor very early on for me. She, I was her teaching assistant while I was there. I met her briefly in New York when she, before I went to school even, she ran a competition that I, I had done really well in. I didn't win it, but I was like, in like second place or something like this. And, and I talked to her quite a bit at that time. And the, um, uh, Maneo, I, I think I was very close with Raphael Maneo. Also, he was a men he's a mentor to, I suppose, as well. Um, Yves Lambois in art history, very, was very close to, even I still am, and you know, we did his studio and we did some work with him and he was imp important uh, to me as also thinking about architecture in, kind of in a way. Um, you know, I had a, a lot of teachers there that were, that were great. And I think that helped. And, and I graduated with distinction from there. And then I went from there, I went to, I, I applied to a couple fellowships. So I had, then I went to Texas to um, Marfa. I spent a summer at Chinati Foundation. I did a fellowship there and spent some time with, uh, you know, in all the Judd, in the context of Donald Judd, basically. Um, and then from there I went to Michigan, University of Michigan, and started teaching. So I started teaching like, because I, between undergraduate and graduate was about three years, period. And so I, then I went to graduate school and then when I, I didn't, I, I think at that time I was like, I didn't really want to work for anybody else either. So I made an effort to try to teach. I, I think um, a mentor is probably more support than a teacher <laughs> and probably more intellectual, uh, a larger intellectual debt it has to be paid. I mean, I, I think for sure Toshiko and, and Maneo, I probably owe a lot to even in our work, even if it's not so obvious. I don't, and I don't think it is, but the, I, you know, there was for sure, and even Lambois the same, like, oh, an, like intellectually, uh, let's say the, the work still influences us, like problems of composition, or authorship. These are the things that in art history that he was dealing with that I think affected us in architecture. Like I never had Toshiko as a, as a professor either, but she still taught me. But I, I think also I, I um, wanted to learn. Even then I had it as a teacher, but he wasn't, it was, a, it was different. What he was teaching was like Barnett Newman and Jackson Pollock and stuff. But, but what I learned was different things and other, like other, his other writing. And also I learned a lot about how to teach from Evelyn, I think. Like how he t taught was very different than the way that I was taught. I mean, the way he taught was, it was, I was in a PhD seminar as a mat. I mean, it was very, I, I got applied and got into this PhD seminar, even though I wasn't a PhD uh, student. I think it was easier back then. I think for whatever reason, there was less people interested. I mean, it was like four, three or four students total in this thing. And, um, and we would just read together and argue together and discuss things together. And it was not, it was really open and conversational. And he explained he learned to teach from uh, Roland Barthes, uh, who would also teach like this, like in a, a seminar, which was like, really actively trying to think through a problem with the students, you know, not, not coming with a set of pre-made lectures every week, but just trying to make a kind of form in which you, 
you're all working together and thinking through something together and being part of that, which I thought was a nice model of teaching. Um, and I still try to teach like that as much as I can. Beginnings are, are like always awkward and fumbling. Even in a project now, it's like, how do you start anything? It's just, you just start. It's like you make a doodle, it's horrible. You try another one, you do something. But like the, or you talk to, you just try to, you stumble through everything in life as an architect, somebody, unless, the, unless there's a very clear problem, let's say, given to you. But an office, we always say it started in, I, th I don't even know what Hillary would say. Sometimes we say 2003, sometimes we say 2005, but we weren't even licensed architects until 2008. And, and we weren't even in the same city until 2005 the two of us, we were kind of moving around. Um, but we were doing things, uh, you know, through email and the internet and whatever way you could do stuff. So, and we didn't have, we didn't have our name until 2000. And I don't know whenever, I don't remember that. So it was just, it just, we just started and you start and, and, um, like we weren't licensed even, but we built houses with just, with just an engineer stamping things, um, that were, we got the very first project through like um my, it was then my brother's uh, girlfriend's sister i think and then the second project was literally a wrong number like somebody calling looking for somebody else that they heard was an architect that had an a m's in their names and um and we you know i said i wasn't that person but we just finished this other house that we had and so we could do something and so that worked out. I mean, it's very hard to be an architect in the US, honestly, too. There's no, there's no uh, civic or state support for architecture. It's all private for the most part. And uh, unlike Europe, Mexico too is not the easiest, but it's somehow, I think, more accessible because I think it's probably less, it, it just is, maybe easier to build to some degree. Um, but the, yeah, so I mean, I, I think of our peers as not necessarily, like Hillary's always talking to Tatiana or, or um, you know, I'll talk to Kirsten Gears quite a bit or, you know what I mean? Like we have different friends that we talk to that are kind of all over the place and um, I think if anything, at some point when you're doing your work, that becomes also your world to some degree of like your friends and your, your colleagues that you feel like you're in conversation with. Like to me, that's the important thing. I don't know if we're always like New York architects. Yeah. I think we're talking, we're in conversation with some of them, but we're not like, we don't do commercial development. I think a lot of them do like really serious commercial development with co developers we don't we don't really do that work so we're kind of an outlier and i think to them we're probably seen as uh too boutique and uh, academic and but in academy we're seen as maybe the opposite you know what i mean like too not academic enough or something i do think there are some some larger public things, but they are hard to get into at our, at our level as an architect. Like they, we've gone for a couple of them and it's like always Stephen Hall gets all of them. But like the, it's just that, you know, we're at an awkward phase of our career, perhaps like he, you know, like we haven't done enough. Like, you, you know, when you apply for these things, they're like five other examples of the same thing that we need or something and we're like, you know, we haven't done that. So I think the previous model of, of before us was you have your project, you design your things. Let's say Tom Main is an example, or there's plenty of examples, Liz, Rick. It's like you, you design these things, you do these provocative kind of projects, and then you hopefully you, you win the lottery. You find like an amazing client or somebody, somebody supports you to do your thing. I think for us, it was very different. We just worked on whatever we could get. Like if it was like a anything, we would have done, we still are like this a little bit. Well, it's, we, there's not much we wouldn't do unless it's like a really 
sketchy client or something. But it's like, but we wouldn't say no to to most projects if the, if the it doesn't. It's not even about like money or anything. It's just like we want to just do interesting things, whatever we can do. So it's like, um, uh, yeah. It just we worked ourselves up through whatever project we could, you know, and then try to build up a practice from that as opposed to drawing it, drawing it, drawing it, you know, putting it out there and then building those drawings eventually. It's also very different in the U.S. Like my parents would never, they wouldn't have known, like when I, when I studied architecture, they just thought architecture was for somebody else, you know, not for, not for them. And, um, you know, for somebody with more, with more money or, um, yeah, it was just somehow foreign to them, a foreign, a foreign thing. Uh, and I think a lot of people think like that in the U.S. It's seen as like just not something to think about. Um, and, and we need to figure out how to change that. The only way to change that for me is education, but it also is education it has to happen a lot sooner than college. It should be at a very like elementary school or kindergarten or something. Yeah, I think for a long time, our architects, they, they we wanted in the schools, let's say, especially academics, sort of, it, I mean, it was, it became the only place to, to, to have architecture was in schools for a while, it seemed like, when I was a student and things like this, because it didn't exist, like you wouldn't see it on the street necessarily um, as a student, and sp it was somehow within magazines or journals and um, I, I think that's a problem in a way, but I think also it was a kind of desire for some sort of autonomy and some sort of specialization almost of the field or something like this. But um, I, I don't know if it served us well. I mean, in a way, it was like turning your back on, I think the schools definitely turned their backs on, let's say, the community that they were working within. And, 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 and importantly, so like they didn't want to be seen as a service. Like the idea that architecture was a service for others was seen as a negative a problem. So you, they, like the idea that how do you, how does architecture exist without it, without the client or without the community was more important. So drawings became more, like the major uh, vehicle to discuss architecture in some ways. Yeah, if you look at how pedagogy was in schools, like even at Princeton, before postmodernism, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm told this, and I've looked at the, the, the syllabi, um, is like, for instance, every studio, you'd have to do a full-scale wall section drawing. I can't think of anybody who could, any student now, I mean, I find it really problematic. I don't think anybody could draw a believable wall section that wouldn't, that would work. Or even if you look at, I think the the thing with postmodernism is was the real emphasis on rhetoric, like that you'd have co like a project when we were saying the co confusion about the project, there was an idea of like the project was an intellectual project, a concept, and then you have that, and then the work kind of reflects reflects this other thing, and that abstraction, but is so is was so deadly at some level, I think, to the field where. Like you, we, you know, the rhetoric became more and more ever, the focus of attention uh, for everybody, and the building just became a kind of uh, empty vessel for this other stuff. And um, I, I think it's, I, I think it's going to change, but I don't know. I mean, for me, that has we've hit a limit with it, and if anything. Let's say, I don't believe, and this is where Mineo maybe comes into it, I just don't believe in that, the, the relationship to, between, let's say, meaning and concept in a building is, is, is temporary at best, if that makes sense. Like, I think a building can become, have different meanings in different periods of its life, and uh, with different people can have different meanings. So... The idea that it's somehow that the building and the building has its own intelligence, I would say, <laughs> that is not necessarily the same as writing. Like if I meet um, architects from different parts of the world, 
they still think architecture is like uh, Peter Eisman or whoever. I mean, you'll see Cynthia later, but they still think they still think that's what American architecture is. Like this, a lot of theory, a lot of uh, you know uh, of writing, arguing, not really figuring out how buildings work and stuff like this. So. I don't think it's true anymore. I think that's shift, shifting. I don't think it's totally true. I mean, I'm sure it's partially true. Um, like I'd say for, I don't, and I don't think it's an either or thing. For instance, I, 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 I write a lot. I'm probably indebted to some degree to a, 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 the writer architect model. But I am interested in the physical making of buildings a lot more. I mean, I've literally probably more interested in that. I mean, I got into architecture not to be a writer, like everybody. I got into architecture like making stuff. And so the, you know, the, the material, physical conditions of buildings are more interesting to me. And, and even how they perform and how they, you know, how they work as buildings. I teach uh, first year at the moment. I've taught a lot of different things in schools over the time. I've been te I teach the foundational courses, course of architecture at the moment, um, which I like in a way because I think all of, even in our own work, we deal with very basic uh, questions of architecture. So, um, yeah, I mean, I w right now, I just changed the syllabus last year. Um, where it's like three, I, I trying to make it more real to some degree and trying to make it more about working with others more. So it's not so much about just your individual, um, your individual idea. So maybe, so for instance, right now it's like, um, it starts off with just a room. It's just a room you design. And it's in a certain, it's on top of another building actually, but that's local. It's all, they're all around near the school. And then you do a house for two, for two, uh, two, like a, a like a, a double house or a, a two, a two, two other students actually as clients where they have to, you have to like work with them and they have to be like a kind of clients for you. Um, and then the third project is to do a community center but to work with a real local community group. Um, and so the thing that I was hoping to, why to do this, and then there's, there's like material constraints on it. And at some point last year I did like money, but I don't know if I'm gonna do that. I change it up all the time. But like the, um, I did wanna just engage realism, but I also wanna engage this idea that, you know, we're in service in a way with other, we work with others. Like we're not, it's not just your personal, thing, but you have to engage others, different people, and also to learn from others. Like I'm always, I was kind of I'm like, a, this was like last year, but like architects, if you know, say in school, if you have to do like a daycare center as a project, they'll just Google daycare centers. And then you just do Google it and you look at some stuff and you think you know about it. And for me, I was like, why not just talk to somebody who works in a daycare center or runs a daycare center and learn from them. They've spent years, they are experts in this. And, and also it would be wonderful for them to like understand what architects do because most of them haven't, have had no interaction with an architect ever. And so that's what I was trying to change a little bit in the first, in the foundational course is like to make it um, more engaged in a way with the world. I think it's st still learning always, but like let's say just the physical, material reality of things. I mean, I remember as a, I think it just takes a long time to learn how to build and to be confident in it. Like now I feel like I can show up at a job site and I'll be like, no, we should do it like this. And, you know, and I, and I, and I can say it with some authority. I think early on, I would never have been able to do that. I would have been always pushed around by the contractor or whatever. Um, I think that happens with age maybe too, but also just sort of knowing how things go together. I think it's also like natural, like when you're, like when you build your first chair or your first table as a student, it's always like never 
stable. You know what I mean? Like you make it slightly too thin and you want it to be a certain way, but it never, it's always a mess. And I think after a while you learn through making how to make things and you understand the, the way, you know, the way materials and things work. At some level, I mean, I, I am a, a formalist in some ways too. I'm not, it's not only about service. I mean, I care about how things are put together and even in a conceptual, not even materially, but just let's say geometry and form and things like this, but it's very different than the way he would do it. I'm sure we would be seen as conservative in his mind, but our, our interest is like, um, is also in, is, is making stuff in the world. So like, for instance, there's plenty of people in them that, that get upset that we work with pitched roofs, like in our work. And they think that, um, that it's sort of a neo postmodernism just, but the reality is if you're doing work in that where in the areas we're doing at the, and at the price we're doing it, the pitched roof is a cheap, efficient way to build and shed water. And it's not, it's not a pediment. It's not meant to be seen as a pediment or reference some symbolic version of a roof or, or architecture. It just is a roof. You know what I mean? It's just, it's just a way to build a, a, a roof that isn't too expensive, that is, that works well, you know, et cetera. And so we work with those things and we find a way to work with them. I'm not, I'm not, um, so it's just a different attitude. I think if people, you know, that's what I mean. It can mean many things, to different people. So somebody looks at that and they'll see classical temples. I'm really old fashioned in some ways. I always think like architecture is like an institution in a city. Like that's like the most architectural project, some sort of institution in a city. And we've never had one of those. Would love to do that.